You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, goddammit! Get the point. Good. And now... Bend over. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Yeah, you thought that it was thunder. You looked around and didn't see a cloud in the sky. And yeah, you still kept hearing that rumbling. Well, it was either my rocket chair blasting off or it was that chili and burrito I had last night. <laughs> Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on a Freaker Friday night, and it is the final Rocket Chair of the year. So, yeah, I've been putting it out there all over the place. Yeah, this is my last one. I'm done. I'm, I, it's over. Done. Yep, for the year. <laughs> I'm a smart ass, but it's better than being a dumb ass, I guess. Or maybe both of them are equally entertaining, depending on who you're dealing with. Hmm, you're dealing with me. In any case, this is on RealLibertyMedia.com channel 3. Also on the RLMRadio.xyz side. And the RLM Spreaker channel. And later to be on the RLM YouTube channel. And hey, I'm looking over here on Twitter. And damn, I uh, see some Mary Juana from the 420 Weed Club. <laughs> That's party. That's awful party. I had a little discussion with someone at work today about that and kind of explained to her that, you know, it's not necessarily pot that is the problem. It's all that other shit, you know, like alcohol and coke and heroin. And yeah, that's that's the stuff that's not necessarily good for you. Um, marijuana ain't the demon weed that they have made it out to be. But... <clears throat> You know, maybe I made a little bit of a dent because she has a daughter that has uh, seizure issues. And I said, you know, you really need to look into getting some CBD oil for her. See if that doesn't help. It's not going to hurt. And it's something that your body makes anyway. Maybe she's just not making enough of it. Lord only knows. Oh, man. Sue Grafton died. I've got quite a few of her books. I like Sue Grafton. She's a mystery author for those of you that don't know bummer dude okay so over here on twitter thank you ever so much barman for tweeting me out barman from multiple places has tweeted me out over here on mines hey there mines how are you doing i see there's a couple of people that are not happy with the way mines is going well you know what when you start collecting more and more mines you start getting a group think that's just the way it works the more minds you have and the more they are focused on one thing or trying to create one thing, the more you become a group think kind of thing. And is it good? Sometimes and sometimes not. It depends on how many meh you hear in the mix. Or if you hear meh or you like my farm animals. <laughs> Let me do a chicken. There you go. There's my farm animals for the night. <laughs> At least for a while. I might do more. You never know. Okay, let's see. Over here on this effing site, I saw Bobby was over here. Hey, Bobby, thanks for sharing me, sweetheart. Hope you're having an amazing day. Hope you're healing up quickly, actually. I would prefer you to be healing up, darling. And before I lose track of it, of course, I also saw Grimmy was over here and the lovely Miri B and Java Doctor and T.D. Sanders. Hey there, hi there, ho there, all you guys. Now, before I lose track of it, this is something that Sean Tibbetts shared over on Twitter. One of the methods used by statists to destroy capitalism consists in establishing controls that tie a given industry hand and foot making it unable to solve its problems, then declaring that, well, you know, freedom has failed and stronger controls are necessary because that's just the way it works. So, yeah, no, that's not the way it works, darling, but... And that is from Ayn Rand, by the way, for those of you that uh, <clears throat> don't know. 
Um, TD? Oh, looks like earlier in the day she was totally lacking in zippity doo -dah, part two, or zippity, part two, her doo -da day. <laughs> okay, TD. Well, I hope you find your zippity. Because I got zippity and doo -dah all the time because I'm just kind of weird. Um, oh, Bobby. State Department releases Uma Abedin's emails found on Anthony Weiner's desktop. What's it, What's that doing on, oh, it's his laptop. Well, yeah, okay. We, ha, Anthony having his Weiner on his laptop. Well, he, we'll just move along. <laughs> Okay, one more quick check on Twitter. See if there's anything on there that I just can't live without. Um, oh, God, another shooting. Get it out there. Be afraid. Be afraid. Fear porn. Fear porn. Russian hackers plan to rule the world using Ukraine as a training ground. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you have rulers? Is that how you're going to rule the world? If you have those wooden rulers with the metal stripe on the or on the end don't be whacking my knuckles okay it's supposed to be a whack a doodle not whack a knuckle because whack a knuckle hurts okay i'm gonna go ahead and shut down twitter over here in the corner pocket uh nensen dubois is here hi nensen how are you doing hon um since you're not busy with other things, you know, like important things. Oh, you are waiting for the pizza guy. Okay, I get that. I understand. Food is a necessity. I've seen lots and lots of really good recipes lately, and my sisters keep posting them, and it's like, okay, girls, you know, I'm going to have to go up a size in jeans if I were to make all of this stuff that you guys are posting recipes for that I'm drooling over. Ugh. Okay. Oh, well. Hi, Nenson Dubois, with a wonderful name that gives me all kinds of facial exercises. Thank you ever so much. I've been doing facial exercises anyway, because I've been pulling with coconut oil again, too. I have a dentist appointment coming up. <laughs> That's pretty much, you know, you don't worry about it until you got an appointment coming up, and then you go, shit. You know, or with me, it I go all Tourette's. But I'm not ready to drop an F-bomb just yet because I haven't finished saying hey to everybody. So, <clears throat> let's see. Over on Fakie Book, thank you, Gary L., for tweeting me out and the road or sharing me and the road le less traveled. Thank you ever so much, hon. I really do appreciate it. And now, to the place where you need to be if you want to give me static because, you know, I need lots of static because I'm kind of a staticky gal. Of course, that means I probably ought to turn my humidifier on because lots of static. <laughs> Oh, it was a shocking experience. Okay, over here in the RLM, right up top, we got Barman, who is the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. Wee! Mm. Sorry, needed a cup, a, a drink, a, a drink, a drink of my coffee. Okay, um, closely followed is Grimner, who is the RLM god, don't you know, and the creator of Barman. So, yay, the lovely Kate is here. And uh, if I remember correctly, there will be no Moosey tonight because, well, Moosey is, uh, she has a life. <laughs> I think she's going hockey in, isn't she? Going to a hockey game. Oh, well. I see Asmo is here. Hey, Asmo. How's the business going? Hope it's going well. Chalcedony is in the house. Got the O going on. I also see the lovely Circle from Denmark. She's not being an adult for now because, you know, here she is. Staying up way past her bedtime. <laughs> hey there, lady. It's wonderful to see you. I also see the lovely Chloe is in the house as well as Dakota. Yeah, we're up in the Great White North where it's very, very cold. Very, very cold. And we got very, very cold coming at me again over the weekend. Go figure. Yeah, we're going to ring in the new year with zero. At least for a low. <sighs> if not lower. Mm, I don't like that. Hi, Free Enslaved. I am so glad that you were able to get some stuff ironed out with the uh, the USPS. Because, yeah... They can get just a wee bit on the assholio side. But when you start letting them know about things that, you know, even a lot of their employees don't know about, and you say, I want to see, and then they go, um, 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 
Um, yeah, a lot of backpedaling tends to go on when you call them out on their bullshit. So, yeah. She's going to hockey fights. Woohoo! Yeah, well, I've been to a couple of hockey games. They are kind of fun to watch. You know, except for, I'm not real crazy about the fighting. It's like, what the hell are they fighting over? But it is interesting to watch. I don't understand the game at all. Yes, Vinny, I think you heard thunder. <laughs> oh, no, wait a minute. That No, it was thunder because it, it, no, I don't, the burritos aren't talking right now. Uh, free enslaved is in the, okay, I did say free enslaved. I'm here. See, I'm kind of sort of here, but I'm here. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Vinny, you're so silly. Uh, I be Don C is here. Hi, Don. How are you doing, hon? I also see Java, 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 Java Doctor 2 is in the house, as well as JJ's. Hey, JJ's, na na nine, JJ's. And Juana Taco, you know, took care of the burrito last night with chili all over the top of it, and some cheese, and some salsa, and mm 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 and <clears throat> luckily, excuse me, my co-workers were really, really busy, so I, you know, they left me alone, <laughs> which was not necessarily a bad thing today. Um, oh, give you the microphone, Goober. Uh, <laughs> it could get interesting, wouldn't it? Okay. <clears throat> Meister Brower, hey, Woody, how you doing, hon? I also see the lovely Rain is in the house, as well as RLM Fluke. The Vanna White of the RLM channel. Vinny, did you poot? You know, only girls are supposed to poot. Guys fart, girls poot. <laughs> We're more dainty. We have the vapors, don't you know? Excuse me, I have the vapors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I needed another swig. Let's see, who else is here? Rob Works. I saw Rob fire up the bubbler earlier today. Booyah! Thank you, Rob Works. You are the man. And Trusty Feller is here, and he's Bitcoining again. Oh, and Rob just fired up the bubbler again. Yes! A double bubble. That's a bubble gum, isn't it? Only it's nasty stuff. Man, about five or six chews, and it loses all flavor, and it tastes like you're chewing on really, really chewy plastic. Uh, or a rubber band. However you want to look at that. Um, if I can't build a spaceship, what's the big picture? Honey, if you build anything to motivate around on planet Earth, you are moving in space. Seriously. Uh, no, we're not toast if we stay here. I refuse to be live that. Okay, trusty feller, who is Bitcoining like crazy? I also see Vinny. Vinny, how are you doing, sweetheart? And how is Vegas? Wait a minute. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> oh, Vinny. <laughs> you done shat, huh? Oops. I hate when that happens. Um, crowd control is in the house. Wow. You seriously? In RLM, you think you can control this crowd? Good luck. I also see Dima. Hi, Dima. As well as Flash Nasty and Frumpy. And looky there, Gooberzilla is in the house. As well as Kozu. And Mmmbot. Mmmmm. Mmmmm. What? What movie is that from? Oh, The Dark Crystal. Wasn't that where the, the one little Weasley... Well, he wasn't Weasley. They were those big bird-like critters that were always... Mm, yeah, the evil ones in Dark Crystal. Basically because it was the dark half and the light half. I'm not going to ruin the story for you. I almost did. Moy, 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 moy is here. Hi, moy. How are you doing, honey? Uh, did someone pop in and I didn't see them? Gariel has joined. Hi, Gariel. I see you. We could grow grapes on Mars. Honey, did you know that all of that Mars stuff is being filmed in Greenland? There's videos out there that show you. You can even see the lovely little buildings and tents and all that kind of stuff that say NASA on them. Funnier than hell. Um, let's see. Moi, 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 moi. Ninson Dubois is in the house. 
as well as Poxified and Pon Popon Sauce. I see Slim Jim Flim has shown up, as well as Teddy, the cuddly one. And to round out the crew, the one, the only, the Phantom, who did my intro for me. Thank you ever so much, Phantom. You so awesome. Okay. Vinny is now Vinny Vegas. Vinny Vegas. Vinny Vegas. You know that you sound like a mobster. How do you, how do you have an, a mobster from Arkansas? <laughs> Slick Willie and Shitlery. That's how you have a mobster from Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Mm. I have. They've been spraying us like bugs today out here. And all the way home, as I was driving, I kept just repeating in my mind, and then I started repeating out loud, You are inert. You will dissipate harmlessly. You are inert. You will dissipate harmlessly. And I repeated that for the nine miles home. And you know what? The ones that were that they were spraying as I was repeating that, those dissipated. I don't know if it was because I was repeating my mantra or if it because the wind is blowing like a bitch out here. It's out of the north, and it's cold. Cold. Went from like 54 degrees this afternoon to when I drove home, 29 degrees and dropping. So, yay. Okay, where do I want to go first? Hmm. I don't know. I put some stuff in my pocket, but other than that, I really don't have... Um. Oh, yeah, I want to go to this one. Cause I don't remember who shared it. It was yesterday in the RLM that it got shared from Joe for America or Joe from from Amer for America is the one that posted it it's from the trenches world report dot com it is now legal to defecate and urinate on Denver sidewalks what and yet and yet you cannot roll up a doobie and smoke it on the sidewalks but you can urinate and defecate on them sidewalks because well you know we want to be inclusive but only so much so apparently Denver has just decriminalized public defecation in order to make life easier for immigrants and the homeless how about um, oh, how about I just get through this so after decriminalizing defecating on sidewalks the Chamber of Commerce will probably rename Denver as the Mile High Pile City, which, mm-hmm, yeah, have fun with that. See, there's a reason why I don't like going to Denver, and this is part of it, because them people are moon bats. That's all there is to it. No Board of Health? Well, apparently that's how diseases spread, but now every time I think of Denver, I will see visitors or visions of poop and other bodily fluids on the sidewalk. People are required to dispose of dog poop in Denver, and yet it is letting humans defecate anywhere they please. So, you know, please police the poop after your four-legged friends who, you know, are used to doing that outside. But anybody that, well, you know, uh, you know if they were to take every single house that has been foreclosed on, and put a family in there or put some homeless people in there there would not be any empty homes in this ha in this country there wouldn't and there wouldn't be any homeless people on the streets either because they have foreclosed on so damn many houses and a lot of them are just kind of sitting there well you know we got to have it on the books so we can show a loss for the year so that we can get a tax break and then the taxpayers can pick it up for us. Oh, thanks, guys. Oh, well, back to this. What's disturbing as well is that they also decriminalize camping out on private land. So, now you can go out to get your morning paper, but it's not there because the person camping on your front lawn is reading it while defecating on the sidewalk in front of your house. Now, granted, that may be a bit of an exaggeration, a bit of a stretch but that's basically and I brought up this issue several years back you know when I first I I did kind of peruse this yesterday excuse me but um you know when I was talking about borders and we do have borders there is no such thing as a world without borders there just is no such critter because even cell walls are borders if you wish to look at it like that if you have property that has a fence on it, that fence is your border. And if someone can, you know, 
if someone decides that they like your house better, then they can come over and they can camp out inside your border. It's kind of bullshit. You know, they feed you this line of crap telling you that you can own all this stuff, and then they say, oh, by the way, by the way, we just gave all these other people permission. Well, you know, if people want to come inside my fence and try and shit in my yard, they're welcome to try and shit in my yard. But remember, I have two big doggies that like to run around outside during the day. And, you know, even if they make friends with you, don't be surprised if you don't have a cold dog nose up your ass when you drop in your drawers. Just saying. <sighs> Denver City Council had a unanimous vote Monday night to decriminalize the offense of public committing certain low-level crimes like lying in a public right-of-way, urinating in public, and panhandling. Now, I also know someone from Denver who made a very good living panhandling. Like he said it was a bad day if he only made $600 a day panhandling in downtown Denver. 600 a day. Let that sink in. The city leaders and immigrant rights advocates argued the changes will protect Denver's immigrant community from facing unintended consequences. Hmm. Many times it becomes a um, deportable offense if you've been convicted of even a minor ordinance violation that's punishable by a year in jail, said Mark Silverstein, who is the legal director of American Civil Liberties Union in Colorado. Well, honey, if it's a deportable offense, and I know there's going to be an awful lot of people that are going to go, wait a minute, Grammy, wait a minute. Okay, if there are rules to abide by, then um, you need to, you know, try and abide by those rules. And if and if you have a an existing system where you know you're supposed to like cross in from one country to another, which we still have that system. While we have that system, please try and do so in an orderly fashion. You know, and if. To me, it's like if you stay under the radar, whatever. And I know an awful lot of people, a lot of brown-skinned people, if you will, that are here, and some of them are not ne didn't necessarily go through the proper procedures, but they aren't bothering anybody. They aren't doing anything to uh, uh, make anyone else uncomfortable. They're not taking someone else's job, if you will. But they're also not shitting out in the middle of public. Now, I don't know if this is really happening. This is, once again, on the internet. It must be true. It's on the internet. But, yes, Denver is a sanctuary city. And I'm sorry. But, you know, if there are rules and you make everybody else abide by the rules except for this one class, this one bunch of people, for whatever reason you wish to use this one bunch of people none of those rules apply to then you are showing bias and if you're supposedly in this world in this whole we are being very inclusive then you cannot show bias and that is showing bias oh but we don't want to be racist we don't want to be this we will then e either apply it equally or throw the rule out that's the way I look at it if you can't apply it equally throw it out Apparently, before the vote, all violations of the Denver Municipal Code were punishable by up to a year in jail and a fine of $999. The new ordinance creates a brand new sentencing category that carries out different penalties. Most municipal offenses will carry a maximum of 300 days in jail and, and, um, and up to a $999 fine because, you know, they got to have that cha-ching involved. The new ordinance creates class 1 and class 2 offenses. So it's a number 1 or a number 2. Class 2 offenses, which carry a maximum 60-day jail sentence and no fine, those are sitting or lying in the public right-of-way, which, you know, if you're laying down in the middle of a walkway or a crosswalk or something, which is not necessarily the smartest thing to do, don't be doing that shit. Um, unauthorized camping or public or private property prohibited, 
urinating or defecating in public, panhandling, curfews, and closures. We're so free. We have curfews. We're so free. Storage and loading, prohibitions, soliciting on or near street or highway. The class two offenses are so-called quality of life offenses that often impact the homeless community. You know, if you truly want to do something to help the homeless community, find them a home. Find out why they are homeless. Find out the problem and then fix the problem. Don't be treating the symptoms here. Apparently, that's the latest from the progressive city that seeks to ensure it will not sacrifice its values or bend to a broken immigration system. I will agree. The immigration system is totally douched. Totally douched. I mean, they got a waiting list. Last time I checked, which has been over a year ago, it's like a 15-year waiting list on some of this stuff. You know, to go through the process. If you are trying to go through the process in the proper manner, quote-unquote. So, yeah, I understand. It's a messed up, broken system. Stop adding to it. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock and some of the city officials explain that the new ordinances are designed to protect immigrants, legal and illegal, from unintended consequences. You want to know another unintended consequence of coming here illegally? You are at the mercy of everyone that knows you're here illegally. Therefore, you live in fear of them turning your ass in. That's an unintended consequence. You going to fix that one too? These consequences were fines and longer jail terms. Um, and it has been customary in most places for violating the behavioral norms of civilized American society. Well, you know, in a civilized society, period, I would think you wouldn't just drop trowel wherever you could. Oh, I got I, I got to do a number two. Just drop trowel right there and, and do so. It's like, mm, honey, go around a bush. You can find a bathroom. Something. Mm. Mark Silverstein, who is the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Colorado, explains that the real reason behind the changes are many times it becomes a deportable offense if you've been convicted of even a minor ordinance violation that's punishable by a year in jail. Huh. Well, they've got so damn many even minor ordinance violations that I think just crossing the street at the wrong place you can get your ass in jail Denver is considering declaring itself a sanctuary city in defiance of Trumple Stilskin's policies on Ill illegal immigrants but by redefining law breaking and its possible penalties these new Denver laws accomplish much of the same without risking loss of federal funds oh so see now we get to the meat of this story. We're going to do this and we're going to make everybody else uncomfortable that lives in this area. We're going to have to, we're going to make everyone else step lively and watch what they say and watch what they do because we still want to get that cha-ching from the federal government. Now I'm starting to see how this works. Usually the defendants are very poverty poverty stricken and maybe even homeless said Mark Silverstein I understand that sweetheart and it sucks it truly sucks but this is the system the system is broken fix the system or discard it and replace it with something that is not so broken you know something that like oh hey let's teach people to um, be responsible for themselves and for their actions Ooh, there's a novel idea. Apparently, when Colorado decriminalized marijuana, that was one thing. Whether or not I agree with that decision, I understand the reasoning behind it. But this? Yeah. And do you know Colorado is closing prisons? They're shutting them down because they don't have the people to fill them anymore. So if you're closing prisons or you're shutting them down because you don't have a place to house people, I tell you what, you got this homeless problem. 
and take the bars off, you know, or at least make them look like little little one room studio apartments. There you go, a studio apartment with a view. Yeah, communal living. You could take care of an awful lot of people. Sure, a lot of them would be outside of Burlington, which is not Denver. It's not a sprawling metropolis, but eh. Okay. I'm done with this. I'm the uh, I'm done. That's uh, so many ways of looking at that and thinking, oh my god, that's just a mess. That's just and it is a mess. It's a number one and a number two. All rolled into one. So in other words, it's a squirts. Um and I'm scrolling up to check out the chat and yeah, Rob works. I s yeah, it's hard to lead where no one will follow. That is true. That is true. But you know what? You have to you have to when you if you know, if you want people to, you know, follow your example, you need to make your example seem like it's something that um oh something that would be beneficial for them as well you know you need to make it to where it, it whatever your example is show people how it's benefiting you and how it could be beneficial for them as well then others will follow suit and then when they follow suit don't just go oh i wouldn't do it that way go hey cool i'm glad you're trying that you know Give them a little boost because once you give them a little boost and other people will go, hey, hey, look at that. What's going on over there? And they're doing pretty good. You know, the only reason you have any kind of jealousy or crap like that is because of this false sense of lack or scarcity. There's an awful lot of created scarcity in this world. Oh, well. A lot, a lot, a lot. And then there's an awful lot of, you better do it because those people over there, they hate you for your freedom. You're so free, they hate you, but you better go and sign up and you, you need a permit for that. But you're free. You're free. Yeah, remember that. Uh-huh. You're so free, you, they allow you to go and pay them to get a permit for something that you should be able to just do. If you ain't hurting anyone else. Hey. Hello, Rascal. Are you going to help me tonight? You're ever so helpful, girlfriend. Not. <laughs> My key cat. Okay. There we go. Got that over here on that effing side as well. And I think I'll just plop this in. <laughs> Whew. Yeah. Pun intended. I'll just plop this in over here on mines as well. Ain't that the shits? <laughs> I think I'll actually say that. <laughs> okay. So, now that I've gotten that one out of the way, I want to get to some things that are a little bit more uplifting, a little bit more uh, feel good. And I, I saved Circle's Danish rye bread recipe because it looked so yummy that I just had to save it. Okay, before I get to something else, it's a little bit more. What? DHS expanding up. Mm -hmm. I'm reading what I threw in my pocket, and some of this stuff I don't remember throwing in my pocket. Honest and for true. Okay, from the conservative tree, the mistresses of mirrored halls looking at the corrupt DOJ side of Operation Trump. Oh, let's check this out, shall we? What Snuffle? Oh, oh, Snuffles is upset because I got a kitty cat on my lap. <laughs> what, baby girl? I know, you're such a woo. Okay. This is from yesterday as well. The mistresses of mirrored halls looking at the corrupt DOJ side of Operation Trumple Silskin. This is by Sundance over here on the Conservative Treehouse. The leadership of the DOJ and the FBR. I. <laughs> My poor doggy. 
She just does not like it when the kitty cat's on my lap. Um, and it's too cold to put them outside. So, yeah, she's going to be in here singing to you off and on. If you can hear that. Yes. Um. Oh. Why, thank you, Beth. Okay. Uh, where am I at? Where am I at? Okay. So. Leadership of the DOJ and FBI are intertwined in the 2016 election operation to support candidate Shitlery Clinton and defeat candidate Donald Trumple Stilskin. However, most of the investigative discussions center around the FBI side of the equation, and there's a good reason for that. The FBI side of the conspiracy is pretty straightforward. FBI Director James Comey, FBI Assistant Director Andrew McCabe, FBI Chief Legal Counsel James Baker, FBI... <laughs> it's really hard to be serious when I got a puppy over here going... <laughs> I have no idea how she makes that noise, but it's funnier than hell to listen to it. <laughs> Okay, FBI counterintelligence head Bill Priestap, FBI counterintelligence agent Peter Straz or Strazok, however you say that, and hey, get out from under my desk. Good God, get out of there. Get out. Ding dongs. Oi, gonna pull cords and then I'll really be in trouble. Okay, where was I at? Oh, they all played a participatory role in the Operation Trump. In 2016, FBI counterintelligence operation was surveillance on the trump stilskin campaign and was thinly disguised under the fraudulent auspices of an FISA warrant. So, once again, here we have under the color of the law. Not necessarily legal, but it's under the color. Someone took a coloring book and colored in that little spot right there to say, see, it's the right color now. Apparently, it's sold as a defense of the U.S. democracy from Russia. You know, them dirty Russians, communist pinko faggot spies, whatever the hell they are, which permitted the wiretaps and surveillance that they perpetuated. Two DOJ people central to the FBI relayed um, and acted as facilitators between the FBI side and the DOJ side. DOJ Deputy Bruce Orr and FBI slash DOJ lawyer Lisa Page. Outlines of their collaborative efforts and the trails they left behind have filled the headlines recently. And on the Department of Justice side of the operation, specifically the DOJ leadership involvement, things are less clearly outlined. Again, there's a reason for that. The DOJ involvement surrounds legal arguments, processing the FISA applications, and use of legal systems to support the FBI with actionable legal framing against Trump Stilskin mostly after their candidate Shitlery was defeated. In other words, we're going to have a hissy fit and we're going to make you look bad because we lost. In essence, in the bastardized manipulation of law and order, the FBI created disorder and the DOJ weaponized that manufactured disorder to launch a legal attack against their ideological political opposition. Coda Select Trumple Stillskin. Unlawfulness and Disorder. <clears throat> oh, and you know what? This is not nearly as interesting as I thought it would be. And I'm just going to let you guys finish reading this. It's from, I mean, I want you to be Andrew Breitbart. I think I need to be Andrew Breitbart too, but Andrew Breitbart's dead, so I, maybe I don't want to be Andrew Breitbart. Although I really liked Andrew Breitbart. Hi, P. Bunyan. Hi, Kate. I see you. I hope you guys are having an absolutely amazing evening. Oh, yes, Goobrazilla. It is simple. No war, no money. No money, no war. Ah, it's a little bit of a circular logic kind of thing, but yeah, that's kind of the way it works. What is that mind's thumbnail, Grimmy? 
let me check this out. Okay, so we know that there's dirt on all sides of the equation. Um, okay, Grimmy shared this. Eskimo, if I did not know about God and sin, would I go to hell, priest? No, not if you did not know. Eskimo, then why did you tell me? Ah, yeah, why did they do that? Because if they don't instill a fear of death, then people aren't afraid of them. And they will go about doing their thing. And a lot of those people went about doing their thing without causing any harm to another. Good one, Grimmy. Thank you for that. Um, uh, da -da 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 -da. So, I'm going to go find something else more pleasant. Because you know what? It's the last, the last rocket chair of the year. I want to do something more pleasant. So how about from Waking Times? This is actually from January 1 of 2016. So it's a little bit old. But that's okay. Because you know what? Just because it's a little older doesn't mean it's not relevant. So, 18 human qualities most needed to advance the global awakening. So, and you all know, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts. Now, that is from William Shakespeare. And yeah, if you stop and you look at a lot of this stuff and you, you imagine it, as it's all choreographed. It's all just a big play. A wonderful circus full of smoke and mirrors. You know, to keep you distracted, to keep you focused on what they want you to pay attention to, as opposed to what's right in front of your face. What's directly affecting you. It is a stage. And they've got you glued. Step away from the boob tube, too. Reality is anything but fixed. It is created again and again, redefined from moment to moment as a product of the behavior and choices of all sentient beings. For certain, we are more powerful than we yet know. And each of us is indeed an actor on the same stage. All of us with the ability to impact and contribute to the story. And you know what? Look at it as impromptu. I mean, Robin Williams used to make the directors pull their hair out and the writers pull their hair out, especially when Jonathan Winters joined him in Mork and Mindy. Go off. Go off script. Have some fun with it. Make people laugh. Okay. Yes, Chloe, I am on the radio, hon. Okay. Um, so, our connection through media amplifies extreme qualities of the human experience. Uh-huh. Offering a rather warped vision of reality. Making our whole situation difficult to see clearly through the fog of sensationalism, distraction, and propaganda. Although truth and justice are severely uh, repressed in our world, an evolutionary shift is rising just below the surface of the mainstream, already effectively challenging the power structures and control paradigms that are driving all of us towards extinction. The most important players in the world right now are not in the limelight. They're not celebrities, nor are they freaks, oddities, or authority creatures. They are the activated human beings out there, setting extraordinary examples by living courageous lives, helping to expand our awareness of what is possible, and contributing to a proper vision for the future, which whatever you declare as a proper vision, I don't know. But you know what, if you, if you set an example that does not cause harm to another and others see that it is beneficial 
and that it's repeatable, reproducible, however you wish to put that, odds are. So it's each person taking their, you know, doing their thing and not trying to be in the limelight, so to speak, but just kind of doing your own thing and not messing with anybody else. Of course, these are the ones that are making adjustments to the trim tabs on the rudders of humanity so that the future holds promise for the meaningful sea change. The sea of humanity. In opposition to the controlling forces of fear, scarcity, and decay, we have the opportunity to demonstrate the powers of love, abundance, and creativity. For this to come to pass, we are challenged to bring forth, amplify, and elevate those human qualities which are most needed right now to push the global awakening forward and bring it to its full power. In other words, focus on what you're good at. You know, if you're creative with something, be creative. If you, if you can create abundance in something, show others how to create abundance. So there is no more false scarcity out there, or they don't see that false scarcity anymore. It's that false scarcity that gets people fighting each other. It's the whole, I need to be heard. Nobody's listening. You know, sometimes that is, it's like it, you have a scarcity of audience, if you will. Me? Ah, if I have one person listening, if I have 20 per people listening, if it's just me listening, because sometimes I need to hear what I say, <laughs> although most time I don't remember it, but hey. Apparently observing the world from my little outpost, or at least this author's, I see the potential for people with the following exceptional qualities to play extraordinary roles in this awakening. However, this perspective is mine alone, and the list could easily uh, be infinite. If something mentionable is noticed to have been left amiss, please comment and share your input. Which, okay, let's go find out what these are. People who furiously pursue self-mastery, but are able to dodge the traps of the ego and fantasies of New Age salvation. Yeah. Control your words. Control your actions. Make sure that no one or you aren't causing at least intentional harm upon another. That's a really good way. Number one. Number two, people who meditate but do not worship. Now, and I don't know that that's necessarily the uh, common interpretation of meditation. Because I don't do that. I don't, I don't do the whole um and sit all funky like a pretzel and all that fun shit. But I do kind of get in a zone. You know, I find my zone. And a lot of times it's either when I'm cleaning or I'm working out in the yard. Because that is manual labor things that really don't require my brain to be paying that close of attention. So my brain can go off on a tangent, which it has a tendency to do even on the radio. Um, number three, people who practice de-escalation, who understand the high art of withdrawal, and who are willing to compromise in order to win. Sometimes, if you just say, I can see where you're coming from. That's enough to de-escalate a situation. You don't have to agree with them. Just acknowledge that you see where they're coming from or kind of see. Number four, people who realize that in order to be free, you must give freedom to others. Oh, God, yes. You know, those that say, you can't say that because it offends me, but yet I am, I am free to say whatever I want to say. No, honey, if you demand that you have a freedom, then that freedom is automatically extended to everyone else. Because if you demand it is a freedom for you, it is a freedom for everyone. Oh, Grimmy, it's a cracker, not a pretzel. Okay. Well, if, okay, if I zone like cracker zone, then I'm prone. I'm like horizontal, dude. <laughs> or I'm in my recliner. <laughs> 
and watching something with my eyes closed. I've been known to do that too. Okay, um, people who are capable of staring into the abyss of darkness without falling in and without losing sight of the light. That's a tough job. I don't. I, I, I've tried that a couple of times, staring into that abyss, and it's like, whoa, it's really easy to get dragged into the ugly. It really is, and you have to, you have to learn to rein yourself in. That's a tough one. Number six, people who have opinions but revise them often as needed to avoid getting fooled by them. You can fool yourself with your own opinions. Trust me. I have fooled myself numerable times. <laughs> Number seven, people who are more afraid of conformity than of standing alone. Oh, hmm. <laughs> I'll just move along on that one because that's like, who? Oh, yeah, I've done an awful lot of standing alone. Hmm. Yep. More imaginary rights. That's right, Flasher. I have imaginary rights and imaginary lefts, along with my real left and my real right, or the ones that are real to me because I can reach out and I can grab things. Ooh, cold all the way down to the Alabama line. That is cold. Okay. Uh, people who value experience over suggestion. Hmm. Haven't really thought about that one. Number nine, people who love themselves first and protect themselves first. Now, that may sound like a very egotistical way of looking at things, but you know what? If you ain't still here, you can't help anybody else. And if you run yourself ragged trying to take care of everyone else, you are going to go down, and then who's going to take care of everyone else? Got to take care of yourself first. That way, you can be of assistance to others. Number 10, people who respect the universal principle that nature is here for our use, but not for our abuse. Amen. Or, seeing as how it's Friday, and I am a Pastafarian, or I identify, that's the closest religion I'll identify to. Raw men. Nature is here for us to use, but not abuse. And this land that we live on, this piece of dirt that we say that we own, it's here for our use. We get to use it for a while, but once we're gone, someone else is going to use it. Don't abuse it while you're here. Try and leave the place a little bit better than when you got there. You know, it's like my mom always taught me, if you're going to borrow something from someone, return it in as good as or better shape than what you got it in. Don't return it broken. Number 11, self-healers and self-teachers who survive by practicing independence. That's a lot of them. There are people out there that go to the school of hard knocks and can end the day with a smile. Booyah to you. Even if you're not necessarily smiling on the outside, if you got that little, I accomplished something at the end of the day, booyah to you. Number 12, people who understand the import and impact of history, but who are willing to abandon it or escape from it. Now, see, that's one of those things where a lot of, you, if you stop and realize, if you really just sit there and, and think, where I am right now is the culmination of Everything that I have heard, everything that I've seen, everything that I've done, everything I've said in the past, all of that has brought me to this point right here. This person right here is the culmination of all of that. Are you happy with the culmination? If you're not, shift a little because you're the only one that can make you happy. People, number 13, people who appreciate and rapidly exercise the power of saying no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Saying no is actually a very good exercise for some of us that have a hard time with that word. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Number 14, people who recognize that material truth is multi-layered and rarely revealed in its entirety at once. 
Yeah. You know, sometimes you can look at something and you can go, that's a bad thing. You know, it's like a forest fire. You look at the forest fire and you go, oh, that's a bad thing. Till you stop and realize that maybe part of the reason why that is such a nasty ass forest fire is because the undergrowth had just built up so much and it needed to be cleansed. It needed to be burned off. Those nutrients needed to go back into soil, into the soil to rejuvenate. So yeah, that to me that's a that's a multi-layered look at at a material truth. Yeah, you see a forest fire, you see a bunch of damage done, you see a lot of critters that are displaced and all that other fun stuff. But you go back a year later and you see all this beautiful regrowth because the soil has been rejuvenated. So, eh. number 15, people who know that spiritual truth is revealed in cosmic flashes of total clarity, but whom happily return to their work here on earth when the ride is over. I like to call those my acme light bulb moments. Every once in a while, I can be sitting there just doing my job or working in the yard or playing with my critters and all of a sudden two cobwebs inside my head and an acme light bulb lights up over my head and I go, ah, oh, I just had a epiphany, a fancy word. It's kind of cool actually. And then I get back to pulling weeds or doing whatever the hell it was I was doing. But you know, it is fun to have those little light bulb moments. Number 16, people who maintain harmony and balance by practicing gratitude, acceptance, appreciation, and most importantly, service. Mm-hmm. Yep. Number 17, people who are experienced and skilled in transmuting their own anger into love. Oh, <laughs> that's a tough job. I'm still working on that one. And finally, number 18, people who can laugh at anything. For if it cannot be laughed at, it is not the towel. Oof. Oof. <laughs> Okay, well, I can laugh at most things, usually myself. Um, but yeah, I can. Hmm. Well, that's kind of interesting. And yeah, I can I can agree with most of that. Some of those I haven't tried. Some of those it's like, ooh, that's a toughie. You're going to make me work. All righty. We'll just share this over here. Imagination. What's that you're sharing there, poxified? Let me check this, check this out. Poxified sharing stuff. I'm a C. Frump truck. <laughs> I like that. That's funny. That's fun. I don't care who you are. That's funny. Okay. Thanks for that, Poxified. That is pretty funny. Uh, us versus them, okay. Mm, what will happen next year? You know what will happen next year? I think World War Three will continue, but I don't think that they will be breaking out any weapons of mass destruction other than what they're already using because it is a war on your mind. That's what World War Three is. I don't think World War Three will escalate into bombs. I really don't. Not any, not any more damaging than the bombs they're dropping on your brain right now. And yes, Rob works. There are and and have always been those who wish to rule the world, and that's where the rest of us come into play. You know, there are always people out there that seem to think that they know best. And that we should come to them and that they should tell us what to do because we just don't know what the hell we're doing. And you know what? If people were to stand up to them and say, excuse me, that don't work for me. But no. People, you know, they, they always get this little core group of people around them that are willing to go, hey, if there's something in it for me, I'll back you up. And then that's how they get their strong armors around them. And then next thing you know, they're bullying people. And until people start stepping up and going, excuse me, 
you know, people just kind of get together and say, no, that doesn't work for me. Yes, you will always have your idiots and morons out there. You always will until humanity finally decides to advance, level up, if you will. Um, you're going to have that. You're just going to have people out there that seem to think that they know what's best for everyone. And they have arm twisters that follow them around and do their bidding. And until we just tell them, no, you know, that ability to say no, and then mean it. But that, that takes responsibility. That takes work. That takes us growing up and being responsible for ourselves and for those that we care about. It's not necessarily um, something really easy to do, but it is worthwhile. Okay, cancel that one. Let's do this one. Um, we'll do that. Okay, now seeing as how I did that one, I have one more that I want to get to that I stuck in my pocket because I actually did read this one. It's uh, from didyouknowfacts.co. And I actually kind of like that web page. I was checking out a lot of shit on that page. This is five pieces of life advice from people who've lived long enough to give it. So... Um, sometimes it seems as if everyone has advice to give these days. <laughs> like, kind of like this crazy old lady sitting here in this rocket chair. Um, what to eat, how to parent, whether to buy a house, why Pinterest is or isn't real life, whether it's technically bad to eat macaroni and cheese more than three days a week, but it's just easier to listen to advice when it comes from people who have lived a lot of life. Mm-hmm. Except for people that eat a lot of boxed mac and cheese. And then it's like, no, no, no. <clears throat> I listened to my grandparents long before I decided that maybe, possibly, my parents could know something. <laughs> yeah, my mom always said that between the ages of, of like 11 and 25, children are no longer human. And, and once they turn 25, they start becoming human again. But until then, they're just unreasonable little turds. And, and I find it hard to argue with that premise. Of course, she had 10 of us, so she should know. Okay, so without further ado, here are five pieces of super solid advice from some life-savvy seniors. Number five, love your work for more than the money. Mm-hmm. This can seem hard if you're toiling away in a profession that doesn't feel like your passion. But in the end, the choice to look for the positives when we show up every day is on us. Benny Stewart worked from, a, or from the time that he was seven when he began running errands for neighbors and getting paid in chicken eggs. Bonus! Good job, Benny! By the time he sat down to talk with his grandfather, he had chopped cotton for $3 a day, bust dishes, worked as a janitor, sold insurance, and eventually worked at jobs he felt genuinely passionate about as a social worker and a pastor. But he found a way to love each and every labor. I love talking to people. I've been told I have the gift of gab. So I can talk and I can grasp things real fast. I always took pride in being able to listen to instructions and pick them up quick. My work experience taught me that I can have something of my own and provide for my family and get some of the things, um, get some of the things in like I, that I couldn't. That, okay, that's just messed up. And get some of the things in like that I couldn't. That sentence doesn't make any sense, honey. I just totally mentally stumbled over it. These sentiments are 
um, echoed in an interview with Michiganite Evelyn Trouser, who spent her life working in auto factories. My advice to everybody in my family, learn to take care of yourself. Don't depend on anyone to provide you with anything. When asked whether her jobs were as dreary as they sounded, she flat out denied it. I used to love going to work. It's the people you're with that make a job fun or not. As far as I'm concerned, it's the people you're with that make things different. And yeah, if you can really enjoy who you're working around, it makes it a lot easier to enjoy a job that's not necessarily a fun job. But if you've got fun people around you or people that you can have fun with, whether they're quote unquote fun or not, even if you can mess with them a little bit, it makes the job a little bit easier. Number four, think of hard times like bad weather. They will pass. Sometimes it can be really difficult in a moment to believe that things will ever get better. But if you give them time, they almost always will. So here are some wise words from Agneta Vullet. What I want you to know and keep in mind is that your 20s are very turbulent and that it does get better. You want so much for yourself. You have such expectations and you have so many wishes to succeed. And there's a lot of anxiety that goes with how or goes with how all that will take shape. I never want you to get carried away with how hard it seems. Growing up is a lot like the weather. Every time you hit the big storms that seem like they're going to snow you under, it will change and get better and the sun will come out tomorrow. Uh, what's that? Okay. Oh, Flash Nasty was alive 30 years. Really? You were alive 30 years ago? Good for you. <laughs> As opposed to not? Hmm. Okay. Uh, number three, find mentors who will not only guide you, but also challenge you. It's not every day that you find someone willing to take the time to help you become the person you want to be. So if you do, make sure it's someone willing to push you farther than you expected. Um, Alan Ebert worked most of his life as a physician, but he started out where many people in Michigan knew, welding in an auto factory. But as he told his grandson, there is always an opportunity to learn, and many lessons can be applied beyond the immediate task. If you understand how something works, when it breaks, you know what to look for and how to fix it. Even the body is mechanical. He spoke about how and when to find people to teach, inspire, and challenge you, and how they may not be who you'd expect. Just develop relationships with people whom you can observe, even from a distance, and see how they accomplish things. The way I look at it, in life, we're probably make 95% mm, good decisions and about 5% messed up decisions. A large part of our lives as adults is mixing the mess of those few wrong decisions and you can minimize them by just having people in your life who will challenge you and make you think twice, who will say, well, that doesn't sound right to me. And you know what? Even those 5% of messed up decisions, if you're lucky enough to live through them, <laughs> you can look back on them. And those are a learning experience as well, even if it's for no other reason than to go, I lived through that. I ain't never doing that shit again. <laughs> Number two, be inspired, be inspired by people you meet. When the world seems like a total shit show, it can be hard to remember that the people we meet every day are amazing and can maybe change our lives. If 
we just take a moment to stop and really look. This is what journalist Bill Jans had to say about the most inspiring person he'd ever met. A boy named Eddie, a ten-year-old who lost his leg to cancer, helped me see a little bit about what life is all about. No matter what happened to him, he never gave up. I called Eddie once at home and the phone rang and rang and rang. Finally, he picked up the phone and I said, Eddie, I was just about to hang up. Where were you? And he said, well, Bill, I was in another room. My crutches weren't near, so I crawled to the phone. He was only a young man, but he was teaching an old man to never give up. I sometimes tend to give up and go do something else and he helps me remember not to do that although sometimes it's good to you know especially if you the frustration quotient is coming up it's good to step away go do something different and uh, come back to it sometimes you have a fresh perspective that way and it's not quite so frustrating anymore and finally, the number one answer is uh, be happy making more out of less. Many of us today don't know what it's like to truly struggle. We were born well after the effects of the Great Depression had faded from society. And though our parents might have been altered by it, they did their best to make sure that we were not. The middle class thrived but there was a flip side to pr prosperity. We don't understand how less can be more because we were raised in a world where more is more. And yet, you know what? If you stop and think about it, if you're always looking for more, you will never have enough. That's kind of, don't always be looking for more. Along with great recipes, these seniors shared stories about how they came to be. Though they might have been making the most of what they had with cheap ingredients, something delicious and lasting came out of it anyway. When I was 18, I was married and had a child and did not have an outside job. So I'd go to the library, bring home cookbooks, and try the recipes. Back then, we were on a very limited budget. A pound of fish cost 69 cents, so I learned to cook a lot of things with that. And there are recipes linked here, too. Jackson Blomhard interviewed his mother about her mother. And uh, Jackson's grandmother tells stories about how they, um, pierogies, kept the Ukrainian people alive. Ukraines grew potatoes like nobody's business, and as long as you had flour, water, and some oil, you could make the dough, which I've had pierogies, and if done right, they're very yummy. And there is a recipe here for um, Bethany Bloomhard's Mother's Authentic Ukrainian Pierogies. So try the recipes, try the advice, and you never know when something is really going to stick. So, I'm going to have to check out those recipes. Because I really do, you know, it's fun when I can make one meal or one, you know, like prepare one thing and it wind up being three or four different meals throughout the week because it morphed. You add a little bit here, you add a little bit there. Kind of a ongoing stone soup kind of thing. It is kind of fun. Go away. Go away. Hmm. Okay. Looks like things are getting lively in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and share this over here on the effin site as well. And then I probably ought to refresh it because um, I need to see. That's my problem is I don't refresh it often enough. <laughs> and then I don't see what if somebody's making comments or something. Darn it, darn it, darn it. So. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, there it goes. 
And while that is refreshing, I am going to be refreshing. <laughs> I'm going to go over and check out the pig real quick. See what's going on over here for them piggy guys. Hambo claws, hambo claws. How are you today? He's such a goof. Uh, the word of the day is once again a phrase. Fallout shelter. It is a noun. An essential home improvement now that Korea's belligerent basement boy has a functional nuke and Iran is this close to getting one. Fear porn, fear porn. No, sweetheart. Fear porn. Fear porn. Hate to tell you that, but it is. Okay, yes, Bobby. Oh, okay. Um, in their quotable quote section, a thespian's ego is inversely proportional to his, her, his, her, or its intelligence. Actors are so full of themselves that they can't see how stupid they are. Mm-hmm. It's not just actors, honey. There are an awful lot of people, myself included. There are some times that I think I'm just being so frickin' brilliant. And then I stop and listen to myself and I go, wow, you're, bl you're brilliant, all right. <laughs> oh, well. This date in history, the 29th of December, 1982, University of Alabama's Paul Bear Bryant ends his 323 win coaching career. Wow. You know, this date in history, 1980, I got married. <laughs> 33 years later. Um, yeah. In any case, that went bye-bye. And lastly, this date in history, the 29th of December, 1993, trying to revive his thespian career, Todd Bridges takes the road less traveled in his quest for name recognition and gets busted for transporting speed, a.k.a. methamphetamine. Good job, Todd. Good job. What's that? I see it flashering. Defend. Defend. What are you guys talking about? Hmm... Okay, let's see, back to, I think I'm going to see what I have recommended because I really didn't put a whole heck of a lot of stuff in my, um, pocket, or, in, yeah, in my pocket, what is this one? Here's a did you know facts. I kind of like that page, did you know, uh, in case you haven't noticed. Um, oh, hey, you know what? Seeing as how they're going to be doing the uh, predictions tonight on the Freaker's Ball, or actually Balls to the Wall, here's an appropriate one, Grimmy, if you're listening. This is from DidYouKnowFacts.com. Eleven times the Simpsons correctly predicted the future. Hey, is there anything Homer, Marge, Bart, Lisa, and Maggie can't do? If you answered, tell the future, well, you're wrong, because apparently the show actually had a pretty good track record at predicting future events. Just last week, Disney bought most of the 21st Century Fox's assets, uh, something the show predicted back in 1998. The Simpsons also had a show all the way back in 2000 where Trumple Stillskin was POTUS. Uh-huh. Is that interesting or what? So here is 11 instances that the show eerily made predictions that came true. Number one, Siegfried and Roy Tiger attack. The 1993 episode showed Gunther and Ernst obviously stand-ins for the famous Las Vegas showman Siegfried and Roy attacked by one of their tigers. Unfortunately, in 2003, Roy Horn was brutally mauled by a tiger on stage. Number two, Don Mattingly hair scandal. A 1992 episode had the evil Mr. Burns loading his corporate softball team with professional baseball players. 
poor Don Mattingly got booted from the team by Burns for having long hair. A month after recording his lines for The Simpsons, Mattingly was fined $250 by the Yankees for refusing to cut his hair. How's that freedom working out for ya? Yeah, we're so free. Number three, horse meat. Ew. In a 1994 episode that had lunch lady Doris preparing student lunches with huge tubes of horse meat, fast forward to 2013 and food producers in France, Sweden, and UK were caught red-handed distributing frozen food that contained horse meat. Those guys are good. They're better than Gene Dixon. Number four, a Nobel Prize winner. We all know Milhouse is in love with Lisa. In the 2010 episode, he tried to win Lisa over by showing her a prediction sheet of who would win the Nobel Peace Prize in economics. That's, um, that always works, right? Well, he picked Bengt Holstrom of MIT. And guess what happened in 2016? Holstrom was a joint winner of the prize. Now, I'm wondering, was the Nobel Committee fans of the Simpsons? And it just happened to work out that way? Hmm. Number five, FIFA corruption scandal. Homer petitioned the head of an unknown soccer league in a 2014 episode to better their image after it was accused of corruption. Homer was led away in handcuffs. FIFA, F-I-F-A, was rocked by a corporate scandal in 2015. Homer strikes again. Number six, the lemon tree thief. Bart and his pals were perplexed when a lemon tree was stolen from Springfield in a 1995 episode. In 2013, a woman in Texas was similarly confused when her own lemon tree was stolen. Too bad for the thieves, however, because it was too late in the season to plant the tree elsewhere. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo, although she still lost out on a lemon tree. Assholes. May your butt continually pucker, you thieves. Number seven, baby translator. Remember Herb? Homer's half-brother? Well, in a 1992 episode, good old Herb's baby translating device became a huge hit. Now, fast forward to 2015. An app called the Infant Cries Translator gained some attention when it supposedly converted children's incoherent speech into words. I think babies, before they actually start settling on a language because they're able to speak whatever language from whatever part of the world they're born in or they happen to be residing in. But I think every baby speaks Chicanese until they decide to start speaking whatever language it is their parents speak or those around them speak. I know my children spoke a lot of Chicanese. Um, number eight, those poor snakes. Apparently, in a 1993 whacking day is one of the best episodes in the long history of The Simpsons. In it, the annual snake hunting and killing festival in Springfield angers animal lover Lisa. Florida, shocker, implemented something similar in 2013 and 2016 with the Florida Python Challenge. And you know, we have a rattlesnake roundup out here every year about 50 miles west of me. Number nine, cooking grease heists. <laughs> Groundskeeper Willie foiled Bart and Homer's attempt to steal cooking grease from the school cafeteria in a 1999 episode. In 2008, the New York Times said, Fryer grease has become gold after a clever burglar siphoned more than 2,500 gallons of the sticky stuff from a Burger King and other businesses in California, probably wanting to use them in his diesel engine. Number 10, three-eyed fish. Well, that's not surprising. Springfield's polluted waters bred a three-eyed fish named Blinky 
that Bart fished out of the lake in a 1990 episode. A fisherman in Argentina caught a three-eyed fish in 2011 in a reservoir near a nuclear power station. Sound familiar? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And finally, to uh, number 11, Lady Gaga's Super Bowl halftime show. The singer and pop culture icon starred as herself in a 2012 episode and soared over Springfield in a harness during a performance. Lady Gaga pulled off the same move during the 2017 Super Bowl. Quinky dink? I think not. Although that's probably one of those where she thought that was so cool in The Simpsons. Let's try and do this here in a real halftime show. Mm hmm. Okay. Liberals call me a right-wing extremist and the other side say the opposite. Oh, Vinny, you're just so silly. Vinny, you're just Vinny. That's just all there is to it. Oh, night-night circles. Rest well, sweetheart, and I'll yak at you. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> I'll yak at you on the morrow. Love you, lady. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share this one. Dang, it's 7.30. I only got a half an hour left to do. Whatever shall I do besides have the vapors? <laughs> Actually, I don't. I think all the evil spirits left the building earlier today. <laughs> oh, how funny. Okay, let's see. I know I do this one and this one just because. You know, the Simpsons really did. They also predicted 9-11, although it wasn't a, an obvious. Or maybe it, was, maybe it was. They did predict 9-11. They also predict Trumples. They, they had an awful lot of shit going on, which that's one of those things where it's, I wonder if clues are being dropped right in front of us. And we just flat ass aren't paying attention. You know that whole thing right in front of your very eyes? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, now I'm going to come over here and check out my recommended. Um, the Da Vinci Schedule. Mm, I don't know. Let's see. I help my 28-year-old friend. Oh, oh, good God. Why am I having masturbation shit in my recommended? Good God, Gertie. And there's frightening ways that Trump's America mirrors Hitler's Germany. Thank you, Salon, but no thank you. I don't feel as though I wish to go there. Um, Let's see. How to step outside your comfort zone. Nope. Democrats... Ought to invest in Doug Jones? Nope. Ah. Let's check this one out. It's from QZ.com. 30 years after Prozac arrived, we still buy the lie that chemical imbalances cause depression. Yeah. Some 2,000 years ago, the ancient Greek scholar Hippocrates argued that all ailments, including mental illness, such as melancholia, could be explained by imbalances in the four bodily fluids, or humors. Today, most of us like to think we know better. You know, depression, which is our term for melancholia, is caused by an imbalance, sure, but a chemical imbalance in the brain. Mm -mm. This explanation, widely cited as empirical truth, is false. Yes, I see it flashing at me. Wash my hands? No. Vinny, I'm not going to help her. I'm not going to help her do that. <laughs> Ew, that's just wrong. Okay, so this explanation, widely cited as empirical truth, is false. 
It was once a tentatively posed hypothesis in the sciences, but no evidence for it has been found, and so has been discarded by physicians and researchers. Yet the idea of chemical imbalances has remained stubbornly embedded in the public understanding of depression. You know, there's an awful lot of theories out there that have been accepted as truth. Even though they haven't been proven, nobody can come up with any kind of, um, oh crap, experiment to prove them. And there's lots of things out there that have been proven experimentally, and yet they are considered wackadoodle nonsense. Go figure, we do live in an upsy downy world. Prozac, which is approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration 30 years ago, <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, uh, today, actually 30 years ago today, on December 29, 1987, marked the first in a wave of widely prescribed antidepressants that built on and capitalized off this theory. And you know Prozac is a son of a bitch to get off of. I know people that have been on Prozac and tried to... And if you've been on it for years, it'll take you damn near a year to wean yourself off of it. That shit's nasty. It is bad, 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 bad juju. If someone wants to give you Prozac, say no thank you and walk away. <sighs> Taking the drug to tweak the biological chemical imbalances in the brain makes intuitive sense. But depression isn't caused by a chemical imbalance. We don't know how Prozac works, and we don't even know for sure if it's an effective treatment for the majority of people with depression, and yet they keep prescribing it. Why? Because cha-ching! One reason the theory of chemical imbalances won't die is that it fits in with psychiatry's attempt over the past half century to portray depression as a disease of the brain. No, it's not instead of an illness of the mind. Ah, mincing words here. This narrative, which depicts depression as a biological condition that afflicts the material substance of the body, much like cancer, divorces depression from the self. It also casts aside the social factors that contribute to depression such as isolation, poverty, or tragic events as secondary concerns, and non-pharmaceutical treatments such as therapy and exercise often play second fiddle to drugs. Why? Because they aren't as cha-ching. Yes, I see a flasher going on. What's that? Okay. In the three decades since Pre uh, Prozac went on the market, antidepressants have propagated, which is further fed into the myths and false narratives we tell about mental illnesses. In that time, these trends have shifted not just our understanding, but our actual experiences of depression. And let me tell you, every time you turn around, they have a new kind of depression that they must give you a pill for. Have you noticed that? My God, situational depression or stressful situation depression or st adverse situational depression or man, they're coming up with all kind of nonsense now because people are not taught to deal with things or how to deal with things and people aren't taught how to interact with each other so that they're not being total douchebags and causing problems. In the two millennia since Hippocrates founded medicine, society has embraced then rejected many theories of mental illness. Each hypothesis has struggled to reconcile how the subjective psychological symptoms of depression map onto physical malfunctions in the brain. The intractable relationship between the two has never been satisfactorily addressed. And yet, 
You must listen to them because they are doctors. They have letters behind their name. And fancy white coats. It's all in the uniform. Hippocrates humor-based notion of medicine, much like contemporary psychiatry, portrayed mental illness as rooted in biological malfunctions. But the evolution from Hippocrates to today has been far from smooth. In the centuries between, there was widespread belief in superstition and supernatural. And symptoms that we would today call depression were often attributed to witchcraft, magic, or the devil. Mm-hmm. That's that supernatural shit. The brain became the primary focus of depression in the 19th century thanks to phrenologists and the field of phrenology, which took the shape of the skull as determinant of features of the underlying brain and psychological tendencies, was used by bigots to justify eugenics and has rightly been dismissed. But, though highly flawed, it did advance ideas of the brain still believed today. Whereas other physicians of the time believed organs like the heart and liver were connected to emotional passions, phrenologists held that the brain is the only organ of the mind. Phrenologists were also the first to argue that different areas of the brain have distinct specialized roles. Based on this belief, posited that depression could be linked to a particular brain region. I wonder how much of this, you know, seeing as how what you take into your system and how healthy your gut flora is, because if your gut is healthy, then it triggers other hormonal and chemical releases within the body. So I wonder... How much of this is because piss poor diet doesn't help that you're pumping drugs that nobody knows what the hell they do. Oh, and Sigmund Freud, that sex obsessed, lay on a couch and tell me how you lusted after your mother. Freud, seriously, talk about projecting. Apparently, the attention on the brain faded in the 20th century when phrenology was supplanted by Freudian psychoanalysis. And they argued that the unconscious mind, rather than the brain, is the predominant cause of mental illness. Psychoanalysts consider environmental factors such as family and early childhood experiences as the key determinants of the characteristics of the adult mind and of any mental illness. Beginning with Freud and his influence through the first half of the 20th century, the brain is almost disappeared from psychiatry. That's from Alan Horowitz, the sociology professor at Rutgers University, who's written on the social construction of mental disorders. When it came back, it came back back with a vengeance. A conglomeration of factors beginning in the 1960s but having the largest effects in the 70s and 80s contributed to psychiatry's renewed emphasis on the brain. Firstly, in the US, conservative presidents disparaged as liberal causes any political efforts to alleviate social conditions that contribute to mental health such as poverty, unemployment, and racial discrimination. Actually, <laughs> some of those POTUSes actually encouraged the discrimination and the divide-and-conquer thing. Biologically-based approaches became more politically palatable, says Horowitz, noting that the National Institute of Mental Health largely abandoned its research on the social causes of depression under POTUS Richard Nixon, who thankfully, thank you, Tricky Dicky, was the, wasn't he the one that um, pretty much said that marijuana was a demon weed and, and it was under his administration that it became a Schedule One. Oh, great, Bubba, thanks. That was wonderful. Ugh. Hi. Um, let's see here. So, 
There was also growing interest in the role of drugs for good reason. Newly developed antidepressants showed early success in treating mental illnesses. Though Freudian psychoanalysts did use the drugs alongside their therapy, the medication didn't neatly fit with their theories. And while individuals had previously paid for med uh, mental health care themselves in the U.S., the 1960s saw private insurance companies and public programs such as Medicaid and Medicare increasingly, increasingly take on the cost, which once that happened, it was like, oh, booyah, booyah, now we can really kick this into high gear. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much the way it worked. There's money to be made, and the government will pay it. Oh, don't worry, the government will pay. Yeah, that's pretty much the way that worked. Huh. These groups were impatient to see results from their investments, note, noted Horowitz, and drugs were clearly both faster and cheaper than years of psychoanalysis. And they were addictive, too. You got a zombified populace that way. Psychoanal uh, psychoanalysis also rapidly went out of fashion in that time. Organizations such as the National Alliance on Mental Illness, which advocated for the interests of those affected by mental illness and their families, were distrustful of psychoanalysis. Um, and their blame on parental figures, which, yeah, it's always the parents. What did your parents do to you? Not to say that there weren't bad parents out there, but seriously, is it always mommy or daddy's fault? There was also a growing distaste for psychoanalysis among those on the left side of the political spectrum who believed psychoanalytic theories upheld conservative bourgeois values, whatever the hell that means. At the time, psychoanalysis was deeply entwined with the field of psychiatry and the medical specialty that treats mental disorders. Eee, here we go, cha-ching, cha-ching. But until 1992, psychoanalysis were required to have medical degrees to practice in the U.S. and most had MDs in psychiatry. Psychiatry has always had a tenuous position in the prestige hierarchy of medicine, says Horowitz, and they weren't regarded as doctors or other specialties as being very medical. They were seen more as storytellers as opposed to having a scientific basis, as if scientism isn't telling a story as well. As Freudian psychoanalysis became increasingly rejected as a pseudoscience, the entire field of psychiatry was tarnished by association. And so it pivoted, creating a new framework for diagnosing and treating mental health, founded on the role of the physical brain, we will pump drugs into it. That will make it better. The theory of chemical imbalances was a neat way of explaining just how brain malfunctions could cause mental illness. It was first hypothesized by scientists in academ academic papers in the mid to late 1960s after the seeming early stages of drugs thought to adjust chemicals in the brain. Though the evidence never materialized, it became a popular theory and was repeated so often that it became accepted truth. So if you repeat a lie often enough, it will eventually be accepted and then be looked upon as the truth. Now start looking for those lies, because a lot of times those lies are pretty little lies. They're comfortable little lies. And a lot of times people accept those comfortable little lies because they can stay in their comfort zone. It's not hard to see why the theory caught on. 
It suited psychiatrists' newfound attempt to create a system of mental health that mirrored diagnostic models used in other fields of medicine so they could be highfalutin doctors too and they would not be looked down upon. See, it's almost a sneeches on the beaches kind of thing. Now we have stars upon ours too because we can write prescriptions for drugs too. Yeah. The focus on a clear biological cause for depression gave practicing physicians, note practicing, they are practicing on you, a neat, easily understandable theory to tell patients about how their disease was being treated. This is a dis-ease and we're going to treat the symptoms of this dis-ease because we have pills that you will have to pay for and you will have to come back for and you'll be it'll be job security for us and we won't worry about getting to the base cause of your dis-ease because this way is much more profitable. The fact that practicing physicians and leaders of science bought that idea to me is so disturbing, says Steve Hyman, who is the director of the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research at the Broad Institute of MIT. The shifting language of Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, wow, that sounds very self-important. It was widely and differentially referred to as the Bible of contemporary psychiatry. See, it's gospel truth now. They gotcha. Clearly shows the evolution of the field's portrayal of mental illness. The second edition, published in 1968, still showed the influence of food. Uh, conditions are broadly divided into more serious psychosis with symptoms including delusional thinking, hallucinations, and breaks from reality. You know, there's times when I just want to take a break from reality, but reality is very persistent. Einstein said something along those lines. And then you had your less severe neurosis, such as hysterical or phobic or obsessive compulsive and depressive neurosis. The neurosis are not clearly differentiated from normal behaviors. Importantly, anxiety, which Freud believed was foundational to human psyche and inextricably linked with societal repression, was portrayed as the underlying condition of all neurosis. And you know what? I really think people, yeah, there are an awful lot of, t and I wonder if, okay, you got to stop and think here. We had World War One and World War Two during this, and we also had the Great Depression. How many other massive traumatizing events happened in the world during this time frame? So you had an awful lot of that kind of negative traumatized energy going out into the cosmic field into the cosmic consciousness. It's no wonder people were anxious. It's no wonder. And yet, what do you do? Let's drug them. You know, instead of helping them deal with and work through, let's drug them. The DSM-2 also says depressive neurosis could be due to an internal conflict or to an indefined identifiable identifiable yeah let's say it right events such as the loss of a loved object or cherished possession oh so you're supposed to be depressive and neurotic if you've lost a loved or cherished possession as opposed to losing a loved or cherished companion or family member or whatever Apparently, the notion of internal conflict is explicitly drawn from Freud's work, which posited that internal psychological conflicts drive irrational thinking and behaviors. The third edition of the DSM, published in 1980, uses language far closer to contemporary professional depictions of mental illness. 
It does not suggest internal conflicts cause depression. Anxiety is no longer portrayed as the underlying cause of all mental illnesses. And the manual focuses on creating a checklist of symptoms, whereas the DSM-2, none were listed for depressive neurosis. Checklist, checklist, checklist. Yes, you get this pill, this pill, this pill. Cha-ching! Today, the DSM-5 lists various kinds of depressive disorders, such as depressive disorder due to another medical condition. Seriously. Substance and medication induced depressive disorder and major depressive disorder. Each of these disorders is distinguished by typical duration and its link to various causes. But the listed sy symptoms are broadly the same. It also says the common feature of all of these disorders is the presence of sad, empty, or irritable mood accompanied by somatic and cognitive changes that significantly affect the individual's capacity to function. What differs among them are issues of duration, timing, and presumed etymology, which pretty much is determinant on what pill you're going to get. The problem is that Though various people could be classed as suffering from a distinct depressive disorder according to their life events, there aren't clearly defined treatments for each disorder. Patients from all groups are treated with the same drugs. Ah, oh, <laughs> it's a one-size-fits-all. Alrighty. Though they are unlikely to be experiencing the same underlying biological condition, despite sharing the symptoms. So currently, a hugely heterogeneous group of people are prescribed the same antidepressants, adding to the difficulty of figuring out who responds best to which treatment. Well, I'm thinking the doctors respond best because, cha-ching, that's what I'm thinking. <sighs> this goes on for a while and I'm just going to let you guys finish reading it if you are interested. I am just about out of time. So y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on this Freaker Friday evening, the last rocket chair of the year. And uh, please stick around because Balls to the Wall will be on later on this evening and have those predictions ready. I know Grimmy thinks I probably did quite a few farcical or at least a couple of farcical ones earlier today. But I truly believe if you put the thought out there to the universe, the universe will try to comply. So my thoughts are I predict that somebody put some, put some kind of um, vapor into the Congress and Senate while they're in session that, you know, like vape pens, some really good indica or sativa i don't care which one but you know get them all stoned and kicked back and max relaxing and then say hey yo guys how's about we um just kind of say wipe the slate clean on all bureaus and laws and you know what if you give each and every one of them a bag of doritos of their favorite flavor you could probably get it done <laughs> And if not, you know, it's a lovely thought. Get them stoned. In any case, y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening. If I didn't bring you some joy, if I didn't bring you some comfort, well, maybe I brought you some hope. You know, that you realize every moment is special. And the priceless ones are the ones that you don't haven't had yet. So please take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful New Year's Eve. I will be back tomorrow morning with uh, Flash Rooney for the Dork Table. But for those of you that aren't listening in to that, 